Now, don't get me wrong, I don't think it's a great program economically. It's an utter disaster economically. But it's, it's the perfect program. I think we probably ought to run this every generation just so young people can see the disaster of what a bailout is. This is the simplest bailout you could ever have. It was for a finite period. We could measure it from beginning to end. And it's just like every government program that ever existed. They came out and they said it cost a billion dollars. It ended up costing four billion dollars. They said, you know what? We're going to... We're going to give you money if you'll drive the car that we want you to drive because we know better than you what car you should drive. And by the way, we probably ought to pick the brand of tea you're going to drink while you're driving that car, but we'll work on that later. We're going to choose your car, and then we're going to destroy your car. So let me find an economist out there somewhere. I'll have this debate anywhere they want to have it to, to say that it's good economic policy to take our time and treasure, to take our resources, to build durable goods, and then to use more of our resources, our resources and destroy those goods. It makes no sense. We all know that. But here's what's interesting. They came out and they claimed about how all the cars it was, it was selling. Barack called this a measurable or a successful beyond measure. He, I mean, he, he was so proud of this program because in the short time it started to sell some cars. Now he counted all the cars that were sold, not just the incremental cars. Now any economist knows you don't get to count what cars were going to be sold anyway. So when you back it down to the cars that were incrementally sold, it came down to twenty-four thousand dollars per car sold. Then he stopped talking about the program, and because. Guess what? When you, when you uh, have these stimulus programs, all you're doing is borrowing against future sales. So, you know, some more facts start coming out as time went on, but these facts never, never bothered to cross his teleprompter. And that is, the following month after, after Cash for Clunkers, car sales plummeted like a rock. And when you average out four months in a row, the line went flat. He didn't sell a darn car in that program. He spent $4 billion. I think it's the best $4 billion he spent because it lets everybody know what a stimulus really does. And now we flash forward a few months, and August 2010 is the worst car sale month in U.S. history. I'm sorry, let me correct that. The worst car sale month in 27 years. Cash for clunkers, an absolute disaster. I think we, have to, we need to run it every, every uh, generation or so, every 25 years, let people see what this stuff's about. Because the spending he did was so much bigger than that. And I have such a problem with it. And I don't need to go after him personally to, to do that. But I, I, I would go after everything he's done. I want to win in the marketplace of ideas. I will launch the mother of all family feuds if I have to. It will be an epic showdown for the heart and soul of this country. It will be liberty versus tyranny. It will be the free market against government control. It will be big government against a free people. Because he has some explaining to do. Now, not a lot of people like to ask, want to ask him questions, or at least they don't allow cameras around when people have, want to ask him questions. But I believe the man, I think, he's a, I think he's a good man. I think he's a smart man. I can say I think he's a man of impeccable genetics. <laughs> but I think he's a man who profoundly misunderstands the greatness of this country. He believes the greatness of this country is in our government, and I believe the greatness of this country is in our free people. So I think... I think he has some explaining to do. And I'd like to make him explain the failed 862 billion stimulus plan. I'd like him to explain the double-digit inflation. I'd like to see him explain the takeover of the automobile industry. I'd like to see him explain this disaster in the making of Obamacare. And how about the 16,000 new tax collectors, the, half, the $500 billion in Medicare cuts? I'd like to see him explain why he broke his eight pledges, eight pledges to hold health care reforms in public. I'd like to have him explain why he abandons our strongest ally in the Middle East, Israel. I'd like to see why he abandons our allies like Poland and the Czech Republic and makes them tear down their missile defense shields. I would like to have him explain why he refuses to meddle in Iran while they race for the bomb. I'd like to have him explain why he won't even defend our own borders. I want to make him explain why he broke his pledge to not increase taxes on anybody earning over $250,000. And while we're at it, I'd like him to explain why people who do earn over $250,000, the people who create jobs in America, aren't already paying enough taxes. I'd like to know why he wants to have yet another stimulus. I want to know why he thinks taxpayers should pony the bill for another stimulus when the first one failed so miserably. I want to know, I want to know why he... I want to know why he wants the permanent bank bailouts, why he thinks he needs to control what every bank does. I want to know why he thinks he or any other president should exercise the unholy power of trying to decide which Americans should be winners and which Americans should be losers.
just like our just like our original Tea Partiers, we have a mission today. Voting is not enough. There is too much to fight for. We have to get engaged. We have to step out of our comfort zone. We have to get involved in ways that we never have. And believe me, I know what I'm saying when we have to do things that we didn't ever dream we would do before. Let me, let me leave you with this, with this one thing, this one thought. Uh, early in my training, when I was in medical school, I was doing the obstetrics rotation. And uh, I was going to check on a patient. And there was actually there were a couple emergencies going on and a couple C-sections going on in, in other areas. And I wanted to see this patient, and she was about to deliver. It was a rapid delivery. It was unexpected, precipitous delivery. And um, I was all she was going to get. No, I had never delivered a baby. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I thought to myself, you know, babies have been delivering themselves for 5,000 years. So how hard can this be? But, um, but, you know, no, I'm like, why does it, why does it sheet? I'm like, what am I going to do? I, I don't want to do this. My first inclination was to run out the door and go find somebody else. Let somebody else take care of this problem. But I realized in training in medicine, there are so many times where, where you're called upon to do things you're just not comfortable to do, comfortable doing, and you just have to because people need you. And if you don't, disasters will happen. And, and this is the kind of thing that starts becoming not just what you do, it becomes who you are. And you know you have, you know you have to do this. And so... I start gowning up, and the nurse is helping me, and the patient's behind me, and the only mother who ever asked me if I've ever delivered a baby before was the first mother. So she said, I, I hope you've done this before. And I have my back to her, I'm gowning up, and, I'm, and I look at the nurse, I'm like, oh. and, 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 uh, and I'm thinking, I can't lie to her. And yet, I can't tell her that, it is, that this is the first one because all it's going to do is introduce panic into this whole situation that's already bad enough. So I, I gathered myself. I, I, I tried to calm my face. I tried to speak with a slow and deliberate voice. And I turned around and just kind of looked at her and laughed a little. And said, Don't you worry. You'll be fine. I look back at the nurse. My back's now to the patient. I'm like... And the nurse leaned into me and, and whispered something in my ear that I'll never forget. She leaned into, my, leaned into me and she said, Don't you worry. You'll be fine too. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you step out of your comfort zone, and you need to for this election, too much is at stake. You need to get involved. You need to vote, but voting's not enough. You need to donate. You need to max out a donation to someone if you can. And if you can't, send them $10 or anywhere in between. When you put your name in that role, they know. They know that you are a part of the team. You... You have uh, invested in that future. Go and volunteer for that campaign. Get involved with AFP. Don't leave without putting your name on that list tonight. History will know you to, by name as the patriots you are when you get involved. It's not enough to, anymore to be on the sideline. Our country demands more of us. Our children demand more of us. You demand more of us. We have to make this happen. And when you do, you'll be fine. So let me say... We are the proud heirs of the patriots who have come before us, and we must be as worthy in our hour as they were in theirs, because today we have our own rendezvous with destiny. I realize that every Goliath story seeks its David, but this is something so much more. This is an army of Davids. You are the army of Davids, and we will not go silently in the night. We will not back down. We will change this Congress. We will change this country, and with the righteous winds of liberty at our backs, we will change the world. Thank you. God bless you all.